this week on Lawyers and Company. If you can sell yourself as someone who knows how Washington works, someone who has these relationships, someone who can get on the phone and get the President of the United States to pardon you know, your fugitive client, that's a very, very marketable commodity. I mean, if you, see, if you are seen as someone who knows how this town works, someone who is a usual suspect in this town, you can dine out for years. That's why no one leaves. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz, the Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation, the HKH Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. Whatever you're doing these last days of summer, stop. Take some time and read this book. I promise you will laugh and cry, and by the last page, I think you'll be ready for the revolution. The title is This Town, and it's an up-close look at how our nation's capital really works. I can tell you, it's not a pretty picture. Here's just one example. Three men on a summer's day in Mississippi. Why are they smiling, and what are they really up to? Yes. That's former President Bill Clinton on the right, and on the left, his best friend forever, Terry McCullough, former chairman of the Democratic National Committee, fundraiser supreme for both Bill and Hillary, and the personification of the corporate wing of the Democratic Party. Smack in the middle, that's Haley Barber, former chairman of the Republican National Committee. He made a fortune lobbying for corporations, especially for the tobacco industry, then went home to serve two terms as governor of Mississippi and couldn't wait to get back to Washington, where once again he's gunslinging for the big boys. So why did these three D.C. desperados ride into a small Mississippi town? Seems that when Barber was governor, he offered McCullough a very attractive state package of price and tax subsidies for a plant there to build electric cars for his green tech automotive company. McCullough also tapped his politically connected network for more than $100 million in capital with the help of Hillary Clinton's brother, Tony Rodham, whose company, Gulf Coast Funds Management, shares office space with Green Tech and raised money from overseas. They held this big shindig for Green Tech's grand opening last year, and that's where this picture was snapped of three very happy crony capitalists. Unfortunately, Back in Virginia, where Green Tech is based and McAuliffe is running for governor, the company has produced very few jobs and is under investigation into whether McAuliffe and Tony Rodham made improper use of a federal program for foreign investors. Mark Leibovich was there in Horn Lake, Mississippi, covering the triumvirate of McAuliffe, Barber, and Clinton as they charmed the locals. He is the chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine and the author of This Town, which has everyone who's anyone in Washington talking. What a tale it is. Mark Leibovich is with me now. Welcome. Hi, Bill. It's good to be here. I've read your book twice. It's fun to read. It's eye-opening. I learned a lot from it. And yet, at the core of it, there's a tragic story. You see that? Absolutely. I, I didn't see it fully as I was writing it, but I see it in how people outside of Washington have reacted to it. The tragic story is that what has grown up in this city that was supposedly built on public service is this permanent feudal class of, of insiders, of people who are not term limited, of people who never leave and never die, figuratively never die, um, and who are there and who are doing very, very well for themselves, very, very well for Washington, and not very, very well for the United States. 
Can you frame the historical moment in which you're writing? I would frame it really over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years. You've had this explosion of money in politics. Gold rush, you call it. It's a gold rush. People now come to Washington to get rich. Uh, that was never the defining ethic of the town, certainly 30 years ago. There is now so much money. It is now the wealthiest community in the United States. Uh, it is home to seven of the wealthiest 10 counties in the United States. And, and frankly, it is... I mean, power is obviously going to be very alluring. There's going to be some idealists. There's going to be the make a difference types. But ultimately, this has more in common with Silicon Valley, with Hollywood, than with Wall Street, which is a rush to cash in. It is a rush to somehow take from this big entity, this big marketplace, some kind of reward, as opposed to doing something that will reward the country. What's stunning is how disconnected Washington is, the political Washington that you write about from the lives of everyday people, is it because of this gold rush? When you look at the disconnect between Washington and the rest of the country, which people talk about, I mean, there's a shorthand, well, Washington is out of touch, right? People don't fully know what that is made of. I mean, I, th I think you see intuitively on TV or when you visit Washington that people don't talk and deal with people the way most Americans talk and deal with each, each, with each other. I mean, there's, there's a, language, a language of obsequiousness, a language of selling, a language of spin. But, most, but look, it is a wealth culture. These are people who are doing very, very well. It's true in the demographics. It's true in the sensibility. The people you write about in here seem very comfortable with this town. They do. I mean, it's been very, very good for them. I mean, it's been, look, this town has worked for a lot of people, a lot of very good people, a lot of very bad people, and a lot of very mediocre people. Um, but these are, a, a lot of this book is, in, is, is filled with profiles of people who have made this town work for them. What do the readers out across the country tell you about the picture you have reported? Well, it's, the disconnect, it's, it's interesting, Bill, has been very much displayed in the reaction to the book. I mean, I think in Washington, you have had a very carnival-like reaction to the book. It's like, oh, who wins? Who loses? What are the nuggets? Um, will Leibovich be cast out? Will he not be invited to lunch or to party X or Y again? So you have a, a very silly and shallow read inside the Beltway, which is titillating, I guess, in its, in its own way. Outside of Washington, you have a truer sense of the outrage. You have a sense of an education. You have a sense of, oh my goodness, I've known Washington has been something I've been disappointed in, but I didn't know it looked like this. I didn't know it had come to all of this, just this cont incredible contempt for what they are supposed to be there for, contempt for what their constituents are, i.e. us. You say political Washington is an inbred company town where party differences are easily subsumed by membership in the club, and you've talked about the club. The club swells for the night into the ultimate bubble world they become part of a system that rewards, more than anything, self-perpetuation. Self-perpetuation is a key point in all of this. It is what you are going to, how you're going to continue. I mean, the original notion of the founders is that a president or a public servant would serve a term, a couple years, return to their communities, return to their farm. Now, the organizing principle of life in Washington is how are you going to keep it going? Whether it's how are you going to stay in office, you know, by, by pleasing your leadership so that you get money, by raising enough money so that you can get reelected, by getting a gig after you're done with Congress, after you're done in the White House, by getting the next gig. Mr. Smith goes to Washington and ain't. No, it isn't. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it isn't. And, and look, I tried to find a Mr. Smith character. I wanted to, and, I, and I had some back and forth with the first publisher of this book, which is not the ultimate publisher of this book, about finding someone to root for. They wanted someone to feel good about, um, to, to sort of run through the narrative. And there are people I think I could root for. There are people I like in Washington. I think people who are there for the right reasons. But I couldn't find him or her. And ultimately, I gave up trying. And I tried to sort of create a cumulative picture over a five-year period. What, what does that say to you? I think ultimately it says that this is not, well, first of all, it's a very cautious culture. I and mean, I think cowardice is rewarded at every step of the way. Ah, so? 
it's rewarded in Congress. You, you, everything about the congressional system, whether it's leadership, whether it's how money is raised, is going to reward cowardice. The true mavericks are going to be punished in some ways. If you, are going, if you want to build a career outside of office when you're done, when you're voted out, as a lobbyist, as a consultant, as many of them do, you are absolutely, in, you are absolutely encouraged to, to not anger too many people. Not, not take a big stand not, then. Not take a big stand, right. No truth is going to be told here by, based on any sort of cowardly go along, get along way. Um, and I think that, that there are many ways in which the money, the, fine, the, the system is financed, the politics are financed the way the media works, that will not under any circumstances reward someone who takes a stand. As you and I both know, many Americans see Washington today as a polarized, dysfunctional uh, city, one that is not sufficiently bipartisan. But you describe it as a place that becomes a determinedly bipartisan team when there is money to be made. It is absolutely true. I mean, ultimately, the business of Washington relies on things not getting done. And this is a bipartisan imperative. If a tax reform bill passed tomorrow, if an immigration bill passed tomorrow, that's tens of billions of dollars in consulting, lobbying, messaging fees that are not going to be paid out. Let's take one example. Yeah. April 20th, 2010. The Deepwater Horizon oil rig explodes in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. 11 people killed. The largest marine spill in the history of the industry. Oil gushes onto the seafloor for at least 84 days. You, Leibovich, look at that crude oil flowing uh, into the Gulf and you see an equally large flow of cash spreading across Washington, covering our nation's capital to, quote, as you say, manage the crisis. Now, yes. tell us how they set about to manage that crisis. So BP is in this whole heap of trouble, okay? They, they have this disaster that they are pegged with. Uh, the president looks powerless. I mean, what are you going to do? You have this, this awful calamity taking place. Systematically, BP is spending tens of millions of dollars to basically tie up the most, the most prominent Washington Democratic and Republican lobbyists, media consultants, ad people, to where you had an all-star roster. And all of a sudden, everyone is working together. I mean, you had rhetoric of President Obama you know, criticizing BP. You had BP saying, oh, no, we're going to make this right. You had Republicans saying, oh, the president should be doing more. So you had this TV sort of debate, the same noise you would see any other, in either, any other story, juxtaposed with these terrible oil-soaked pelican pictures from the Gulf, when in fact the city is just reaping this bounty. You say BP, British Petroleum, put together a Beltway Dream Team that included Republican super lobbyist Ken Duberstein, Democratic super lobbyist Tony Podesta, former Vice President Cheney's one-time spokeswoman Ann Womack Colton, Republican flacks like John Fury and Democratic flacks like Steve McMahon, and McMahon's business partner, the Republican media guru, Alex Castellanos, who's a contributor to CNN. Yeah, McMahon's on MSNBC, and so it's very bipartisan that way, too. And McMahon, the Democrat, and Castellanos, the Republican, are partners in a firm called Purple Strategy. BP hires them to spearhead this $50 million television campaign you talk about. To those affected in your families, I'm deeply sorry. They were brought, you say, into the fold by the Democratic uh, operative Hillary Rosen, who was working for a London-based firm that was also working for BP, and she was also a pundit for CNN. I mean, what a web. And again, I think the other piece of this is that a year later, Jeff Morrell, who was the head spokesman for the Pentagon under you know, President Obama's Pentagon, has become the chief um, Washington spokesman for BP. Former White House correspondent for ABC a News. ABC News. This one woman protest. He followed Bob Gates to the Pentagon, with, first with President Bush, then with President Obama. Sort of a classic um, revolving door figure, uh, Jeff is. But no, so that was, uh, I mean, it's a classic two-step. I mean, I also think BP has done very, very well rehabilitating itself. I mean, thanks largely to flooding the media with all kinds of um, goodies and a lot of advertising money, and we're supposed to feel good about BP again. Two years ago, the people of BP made a commitment to the Gulf. 
and every day since, we've worked hard to keep it. BP has paid over $23 billion to help people and businesses who were affected and to cover cleanup costs. Today, the beaches and Gulf are open for everyone to enjoy, and many areas are reporting their best tourism seasons in years. We've shared what we've learned with governments and across the industry so we can all produce energy more safely. And what's the moral that we, we draw from this story uh, uh, about this town? About this town is, well, well, first of all, when there's a problem, there is a lot of money to be made in this town. And look, it's another example of Washington doing very, very, very well. Let's look at Jack Quinn and Ed Gillespie. Jack Quinn is the White House counsel under Bill Clinton. He went on to cable a lot and defended the, the president during a lot of his campaign finance problems during his two terms. Met Ed Gillespie, who was then a Republican operative, in green rooms. They had this green room friendship. People become friends, and in Ed and Jack's case, they went into business together. They started Quinn Gillespie, the first real major sort of bipartisan lobbying firm. One-stop lobbying. One-stop lobbying. You, you want to deal with Republicans, you want to get to Republicans, you go here. You want to get to Democrats, you go here. Um, they founded them, they, their firms founded in 2000. Jack Quinn got into some trouble in 2001 after he successfully lobbied Bill Clinton to pardon his law client, Mark Rich. Fugitive. Fugitive, Mark Rich. It was a big to-do then. Um, Jack was big time in the barrel. He's hauled before Congress. He's being, he feels like he's being looked at in restaurants. Um, and Ed, Gillespie said, look, Jack, in a few months, everyone's going to forget about this, and all they're going to remember about you and this incident is that you got something big done. And sure enough, uh, you know, Jack did a good job for his client. Uh, the outrage dissipated, and the, the, the firm, the lobbying firm, thrived with the rest of the industry. Four years later, they, they, they sold out for $40 million. Now, yeah. how do they make that much money in four years and the talent they bring is that they're creatures of Washington. That's a very, very, very valuable commodity. I mean, if you can sell yourself as someone who knows how Washington works, someone who has these relationships, someone who can get on the phone and get the president of the United States to pardon you know, your fugitive client, that's a very, very marketable commodity. I mean, if you, see, if you are seen as someone who knows how this town works, someone who is a usual suspect in this town, you can dine out for years. That's why no one leaves. You once asked the Democrat Jack Quinn what appealed to him about the Republican Ed Gillespie, who became his partner when they first started bonding, and he answered? Well, Ed got the joke. And what's the joke? I, that's what I said. I said, Jack, what's the joke? And he said, the joke is that, well, we're all patriots. And I thought that that was both, it was some mix of sarcasm, contempt, um, uh, glibness, I don't know. Uh, it, was a, it was a fascinating answer. You report in here that over the last dozen years, corporate America, much of it Wall Street, has triple, triple the amount of money it spent on lobbying and public affairs in D.C. Because, and I'm quoting you, they have figured out that despite the exorbitant cost of hiring lobbyists, the ability to shape or tweak or kill even the tiniest legislative loophole can be worth tens of millions of dollars. First of all, there's extravagant waste in, in the private sector of Washington. If you go to some of these lobbying offices and parties and, and what they're billing people, I mean, it looks like an incredible racket. In fact, these companies are getting what they pay for. I mean, Tony Podesta, who we talked about before, a Democratic lobbyist, talked about how great it is that laws are so complicated now. I mean, it was, it was, the context was, I think it was Dodd-Frank or I mean, in healthcare. It, there are these tiny little loopholes that go on for thousands of pages. And if you can be a lobbyist or, or a lawyer in a firm who can understand this much and you're getting paid you know, tens of millions of dollars, but you're probably saving your clients you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes more. So it's very cost effective. I mean, the, the complete arcaneness of, of this world is, again, very, very good for business. Let's quickly run through some of the roll call of influence peddlers that you write about. Billy Tozen. <laughs> Billy Tozen was a former Democrat, became a Republican congressman, um, went on to become the head of the, one of the top pharmaceutical lobbies in the country. After in the House overseeing the drug industry, uh, chairing the committee that oversaw the drug industry, and he was crucial in passing the Medicare prescription bill, which has meant 
billions uh, in profits for the drug companies. Then he resigned, as you say, uh, ran the pharmaceuticals lobbying arm in Washington, and in 2010, according to you, made $11.6 million. Steve Croft and 60 Minutes did an expose of him. I mean, this doesn't look good. But that, I mean, that, you push that's this bill through that gets a uh, that produces a windfall for the drug companies, and then a short time later, you go to work for the drug lobby at a salary of two million dollars. There's nothing I could have done in my life after leaving Congress that wouldn't have had I didn't have some impact on in 25 years in Congress. And if that looks bad, do you have at it? That's the truth. In fairness to Billy Tozan and former Medicare Chief Tom Scully, they weren't the only public officials involved with the prescription drug bill who later went to work for the pharmaceutical industry. Just before the vote, Tozan cited the people who had been most helpful in getting it passed. I specifically want to thank the staffs of our committees from Ways and Means, John McManus, who did such a great job. Within a few months, McManus left Congress and started his own lobbying firm. Among his new clients were Pharma, Pfizer, Lilly, and Merck. From the majority side of the Finance Committee, Linda Fishman. Fishman left to become a lobbyist with the drug manufacturer, Amgen. Not the least of all, but the Energy and Commerce Committee staff who toiled so hard for us. Chief of Staff, Pat Morrissey. Morrissey took a job lobbying for drug Thank companies Novartis the and Hoffman LaRoche. And Jeremy Allen. He went to Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Kathleen Weldon and Jim Barnett. She went to lobby for Biogen, a biotech company. He left the lobby for Hoffman LaRoche. They did a marvelous job for this house, and we owe them a debt of thanks. Thank you all. We owe them all right. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it happens, uh, it happens with every bill. I mean, I think what was striking about that is Congressman Tozan actually sort of basically sent a resume out on all of their behalfs by sort of doing a roll call in his, his remarks. But look, I mean, the Steve Croft piece, Croft piece was, was, was stunning in that I, I think he caught Tozan just I, not oddly flat-footed. I mean, I think, but we, we seem, I sort of, in reading his face, he seemed almost flat-footed that the question would be asked. I mean, no one is, is really going to burn any bridges. I mean, it's like one big bridge in some ways. And look, I mean, I mean, Jack Abramoff is a name that actually has not come up here. I mean, he is, he is the picture of modern disgrace in Washington, right? The disgraced lobbyist. Um, one of the many books I read in preparing this book was, was his memoir, which he wrote, I think, largely, I don't know if he wrote it in prison, but I think a lot of it was probably derived from his, his ruminations in prison. He, he told about how he knew as a lobbyist, he would have these relationships with people on the Hill, people in the White House, people, elected officials, and at a certain point they would say, hey, you know what, Congressman X, or you know what, Staffer X, you're really good at this. When, when, we're, when you're done, have you thought about what you're going to do when you leave the hill? And they'd say, well, not really. Or they would just sort of leave the question open. And Jack Abramoff said, I knew that when I could ask that question, I owned him. Because there's a, there's a preemptive bribe there. It's, you know, you're going to be making maybe a million dollars at my lobbying firm if you answer this question correctly and you act correctly, I mean, in your office, if you can help us, if you can maintain this friendship for as long as you are in power. I mean, when you see Peter Orzag going to Citigroup, when you see Jake Seward going to Goldman, when you see Jeff Morrell going to BP, it does sort of beg the question, who were they working for when they were at the Pentagon, at the OMB, at the Treasury Department? I mean, you just sort of wonder where their mind is. Trent Lott, you say he's the archetype of the age of the former. Right. What's a former? A former is a former office holder, a former senator, a former congressman, a former White House deputy chief of staff or whatever. Um, I mean, the line I have in the book is that w formers stick to Washington like melted cheese on a gold-plated toaster. They don't go home anymore. They talk about how much they hate Washington, but they settle in here uh, quite comfortably. And Trent Lott was the Senate Majority Leader, uh, you know, very powerful Republican. He kind of abruptly retired in 2007, I think, went into business with John Bro, a Democratic senator. He was a longtime senator from Louisiana. As a member of Congress, Bro had said, someone called him a cheap whore, and he said, I'm not that cheap. And he also said, my vote cannot be bought, it can be rented. 
Um, Trent so you've Law, got the Republican lot and the Democratic, Democratic road it's another creating a boutique, a boutique lobby firm. Uh, yeah, although they, they eventually were absorbed into um, Patton Boggs, which is you know, one of the bigger lobbying firms. In Tommy Texas. Boggs, son of the former Democratic majority leader, Hale yeah. Boggs, who's exactly. arguably the most powerful lobbyist in, firm in Washington. Has been for, for many, many yeah. years. But anyway, so Trent Lott and, um, and John Bro have been very, very successful in the last five, six years as, as lobbyists. Trent Lott, um, a pretty candid guy. I mean, he talked about how much he hates Washington. I said, so why do you stay? He, and he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, well, because this is where all the problems are, but this is where all the money is. I mean, this is what keeps people here. And, and it's true. No one leaves anymore. Richard Gephardt. Richard Gephardt, uh, former House Majority Leader, two-time presidential candidate, a hero to organize labor. Son of a teamster. Son of a teamster. Milk truck driver. Um, gave some of the most impassioned campaign rallies I've ever seen in places like Iowa and you know, well, worked Iowa. for working people for working people I mean he he he, he seemed like the real deal uh, he became a lobbyist like a lot of members of Congress do and he's since um, has worked for a lot of corporations Goldman uh, Sachs Boeing Visa I get from your book yeah many of them not terribly friendly to organized labor in Congress as you say he fought for labor but then he went to work for Spirit Aerosystems overseeing a tough anti-union campaign. And then in the House, he had supported a resolution condemning the Armenian genocide of 1915. When he left Congress, he was paid about $70,000 a month by the Turkish government to oppose the resolution. Yeah, I mean, I guess the word genocide uh, goes down a little easier at those rates, right? I mean, it's, um, look, I mean, I don't, I don't see any shame there. I, I don't, again, he's allowed to change his mind for money, uh, I'm allowed to be outraged. Evan Bayh, Democrat from Indiana. Yeah, Evan, Evan Bayh was a you know, two-term senator. He retired very, very extravagantly in the pages of the New York Times about how Washington is broken, how he was tired of all the yell yelling matches and partisanship and, and how nothing gets done, and he wanted to get into an honorable line of work. And a lot of his colleagues were not happy with this description, but also were rolling his eyes because they were like, where, where was that outrage when you were in office? And, and one of his colleagues said, well, that's the most effective speech he's given, you know, in, in eight years here or in 12 years here. Uh, he immediately joined Fox News. He joined the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, this is someone who was a runner-up to be President Obama's running mate. Um, he and Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff under President Bush, they sort of did a dog and pony act in which they would go out in the country on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. And, which is uh, the biggest business lobby Biggest business in lobby in Washington, in Washington. absolutely. Right. A, a big thorn in the side of this White House and have, you know, been giving a lot of speeches sort of uh, in support of, of that agenda. In your book, you quote one journalist calling by the perfectly representative face for the rotted Washington establishment. Another of your colleagues said he was acting to entrench the culture of narcissism and hypocrisy. That's killing the United States Congress. Another describes him practically a caricature of what a sellout looks like. I would take from your book that you don't think those depictions are too harsh. No, not at all. I, I think it's true. Look, I mean, I just sort of lay out the examples. I lay out his words. I mean, he, again, he was so sanctimonious in his departure. Can we not remember that we are one nation under God with a common heritage and a common destiny? Let us no longer be divided into red states and blue states, but reunite once more as 50 red, white, and blue states. As the civil rights leader once reminded us, we may have arrived on these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So my friends, the time has come for the sons and daughters of Lincoln and the heirs of Jefferson and Jackson to no longer wage war upon each other, but instead to renew the struggles against the ancient enemies of man, ignorance, poverty, and disease. That is why we are here. That is why. He was, so he, he was so disgusted with Washington, and of course he stayed, and, and there are all these examples of, of what he has gone on to do. So, look, it all speaks for itself. I mean, you, you can, it's nice that there are commentators who can put a, fine, a, point, a finer point on it, but this is all out there. Chris Dodd, former Peace Corps volunteer. Chris Dodd, very nice guy, very fun-loving guy. I mean, very sort of you know outspoken liberal. He was he had this great legislative last hurrah um, in 2010, where he you know he authored Dodd co-authored Dodd Frank, 
Uh, he was one of the chief engineers of the health care bill. I remember talking to him when he announced he wasn't going to run. He, he got into some trouble. Uh, he was very, very unpopular and back in Connecticut. Uh, he got in some trouble with a mortgage uh, broker. He took a, a loan, I think, from Countrywide, Countrywide. which was a force in the, in the house, in the house. In the bubble. Right, at a time when he was, you know, presumably, you know, was chairman of the banking committee, could have been very involved in that, but also was running for president in a fairly quixotic. With a lot of money from uh, Wall Street. A lot of money from Wall Street, um, you know, and he basically decamped to Iowa for a few months in 2008. Uh, Chris Dodd, I remember having lunch with him in, in the Senate dining room and saying, so what are you going to do now? And it was... He was, it was a triumphant moment, and he, I mean, because he, these bills were actually going to pass. And he said, oh, boy, the possibilities are endless. I mean, I could be a college president. I might go out to work, out, work for some startup. I might rejoin the Peace Corps. I mean, he had this look of possibility, and I said, well, you're not going to lobby, right? And he said, oh, no, no, no. I'll take that off the table right, right now. And he is now head of one of the most powerful lobbies in town, the Motion Pictures Association of America. Um, you know, he would say that, well, I'm not registered to lobby technically, and it's true, but he also oversees a staff of lobbyists. And uh, the, the, the chapter about that is I talk about just the institutionalization of being part of the political class. I Do mean, you it, think he lied to you? He would say that his thinking evolved. He would say, I don't think he, I, I, I don't know. What do you call it? It turned out not to be true. I mean, he, um, look, it's disappointing. I mean, I just say that as someone who is looking for, for someone to level with him. You say official language in Washington is fraudulent language. It's the language of spin, you know, marketing, PR. It's not how human beings talk to each other. And people don't recognize, you, you become very anesthetized. I mean, Washington yeah. is a huge, huge dome of anesthesia. Um, people don't fully know just, again, the BS that, that is just part of the day-to-day -day transaction. And again, it, it's hard to realize when you're living there. I mean, I think Bob Bennett, the senator from, um, from Utah, he was voted out. Well, Mike Lee primaried him. Tea Party. And tea Party yeah. guy. Someone said, so you're going to, to cash in? He goes, I'm entitled to make a living. And that's, look, it's what they do. Even my friend Byron Dorgan, the former Democratic senator from North Dakota, was once a source of mine. Despite all the populist sentiment he expressed over the years, you point out that on the same day Robert Bennett uh, made his announcement, Byron Dorgan made his announcement, they would be joining together one of the big law firms that includes a large lobbying component. Yeah. And you point out that both had served on the Senate Committee on Appropriations. Now, what advantage did that give them? Appropriations committees gives you a huge advantage because that's money, essentially. It's where money is spent. It's where it's allocated. Where the cash goes. It's where the cash goes. So that, that is the most, by far the most coveted sort of lobbying targets um, when you have either a congressman or a senate who is, is retiring from one of these committees or voted out. You write about Anita Dunn. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Anita Dunn. Anita Dunn is a longtime Democratic operative. She was one of the top aides for President Obama's 08 campaign. She was a communications director for a time in the White House. Very, very sharp woman. She um, was very, very instrumental in, in sort of helping the First Lady, for instance, sort of pass or, or put together her anti-obesity initiative. She's now one of the top media consultants in town. Um, and she's done a lot of work to, I mean, some would say maybe undo some of the work she did in the White House. As you say, Anita Dunn helped Michelle Obama set up her Let's Move program to stop obesity. I'm almost quoting you verbatim. Yep, yeah, sure. Then she signs on as a consultant to the food manufacturing and media firms trying to block restrictions on sugary foods targeting children. Her husband, by the way, and this is coincidental, I'm sure, mm -hmm. happened to be the president's White House counsel. Certainly Anita Dunn has benefited greatly from the perception of her being still a, a figure with ties to the White House, whether it's her husband, who's now the former White House counsel, but, but someone who has all kinds of friends there, who's on the phone there all the time. I mean, that has to be a boon to her corporate clients. You talked about President Obama and his campaign and his opposition to the revolving door. Let me play you uh, uh, an excerpt from one of his speeches. But the American people deserve more than simply an assurance that those who are coming to Washington will serve their interests. They also deserve to know that there are rules on the books to keep it that way. They deserve a government that is truly of, by, and for the people. As I often said during the campaign, we need to make the White House the people's house. 
And we need to close the revolving door that lets lobbyists come into government freely and lets them use their time in public service as a way to promote their own interests over the interests of the American people when they leave. And what happened? They have put this law in place. We won't have lobbyists in the White House. They kept making exceptions. They, there have been a number of people who they have waived that rule for. But ultimately, I think what's happened is more on the other end. You've had people leaving the White House to go right to K Street. You've had people leaving the White House going right to Goldman Sachs, going right to BP, going right to uh, Citigroup. I mean, some of the biggest corporate nemeses of this administration in the first term are now being staffed at the highest levels by people who were staffing the Obama administration. At the well, Peter Rozag, who was Obama's uh, head OMB of OMB director, o o Office of Management and Budget Director. Now at Citi. High level at Citi. Um, Jake Seward, who was a chief counselor to Tim Geithner, his Secretary of uh, Treasury. They were doing all kinds of battle with Goldman Sachs during the first term, especially after the financial crisis. Jake is now the head of communications for Goldman Sachs. I mean, and so many of them have a connection to someone else who figures prominent in your book, Robert Rubin, yeah. Clinton's Treasury it's, Secretary. I mean, there's always been a, a symbiosis between Wall Street and Washington to some degree, but I think the Clinton era in, introduced a whole new level of magnitude to this. And, and Bob Rubin, who was the sort of storied um, head of Goldman Sachs for many, many years, coming to take the, the reins at Treasury was really, I mean, he was a real guru and he brought a lot of protégés, Larry Summers being a, the biggest example, to town, Tim Geithner being another one. And um, yeah, and then, you know, the, the, the economy crashes, the banks crash. I mean, Robert Rubin gets a great deal of blame. I mean, Bill Clinton himself did a mea culpa on Robert, on Robert Rubin. On ABC News. On ABC News, on George uh, Rubin had been a force in, uh, in, in killing Glass-Steagall, which was the firewall between commercial banks and investment, investment banks. banks. And he was a big supporter of derivatives, deregulation. Absolutely. And all that contributed to the fiscal crisis. After he left the Treasury Department, he went to City. Went back to City. You say he made $126 million in he nine did. years? He did. No, he did very, very, very well. You call Rubin the primest of movers in the modern marriage of politics and wealth creation. Absolutely. He was the ambassador to the Clinton wealth machine. I mean, even, I mean, you had people like Rahm Emanuel, who was a, a mid-level White House you know, operative in the Clinton White House, who uh, was able to go out, go to uh, Wasserstein Perella and make you know 16.2 or 16 point something million. 18 million dollars in two and a half years. And then before he went back to become a public servant, servant again and run for Congress. But no, Bob Rubin brought this whole generation of Wall Street people to Washington. Then he brought them back from Washington to Wall Street, greatly enriched. And and look, he's a hero to a lot of people on Wall Street. He was a hero to a lot of people in Washington. And and again. I think Bill Clinton, more than anyone in the last you know, few decades, has sort of engineered this, this, this relationship. Let's get to the press. You write, never before has the so-called permanent establishment of Washington included so many people in the media. And you write, Washington puts the me in media. How so? Look, I mean, first of all, just the rise in new media has given everyone a voice. I mean, the rise of cable has given everyone a face. I mean, it has never been easier to become a media celebrity. And I think punditry has replaced reporting as the gold standard of, of my profession. I mean, the, the media is everywhere in Washington. I mean, I think the White House Correspondents' Dinner is a classic example of how Washington, you know, rewards being famous, being on TV, being your, a brand more than anything. Your descriptions of the White House Correspondents Association dinner, the annual dinner, are fabulous in the book. The dinner's to sold out every table since 1993 at $2,500 a pop. Yeah, but I mean, even the greater outrage is that there's, there, it now goes over five days. You have probably about two dozen pre-parties and after parties. You probably have tens of millions of dollars, some funded by corporations in entertainment, in, in sort of people sucking up to everyone else, and in, in food and musical acts and so forth. Uh, because, of course, you know, a single banquet is no longer sufficient to celebrate the accomplishments of the Washington media. Um, Tom Brokaw, who has become a, a real activist against the White House Correspondents' Dinner, um, said that it, it sends the message that it's all about the people on the screen. It's all about the media, which I think to some degree is true. I mean, the media is feeling great about itself. The media is as rich as any other part of the economy. And, um, and I think the, the Correspondents' Dinner is a classic example of this. Have you attended one? Uh, I have, although um, not since 1996, because the New York Times stopped letting us go. Um, Why? 
they thought it was too. Dean Beckay, who's now the managing editor of the Times, he was the Washington bureau chief of the Times. I think it was in 2007, actually, declared that this was too cozy. He didn't like the message it sent. Uh, he would prefer that we stop going. I thought it was a great decision. Describe the dinner to me. It's just this room full of tuxedoed people. A lot of Hollywood celebrities come in. A lot of people talk about you know the good that that the press does. But again, it's an extravaganza that continues, that it becomes the ultimate bubble world, the ultimate example of decadence in Washington that people know intuitive, intuitively is wrong, but have no either will or ability to stop. This is a big night in Washington. Anyone who's anybody is here, and it, the key question for anyone in Washington is, what are you wearing? So you've got the politicians, the journalists, and plenty of celebrities thrown in between. I had a Katy Perry sighting, saw Bradley Cooper, too. Is there anyone you're excited to meet tonight? Um, everyone, actually. Um, you know, I just came in with my buddy Chris Tucker. It was good to see him. We understand that uh, you know Michael Steele? Michael Steele? Yeah. Yeah. Do I? Do you? Who is Michael Steele? And who are you wearing tonight? Ashley Mishka. <laughs> So you asking people what they're wearing and all that? Well, what, what are you wearing? It's like today, any political conversations you're going to have at all? Sure, we have, and we're having one right now, aren't we? Yeah. Is this still not the craziest thing ever? Well, when so did this get to be like this? Thank you, everybody. How do you like my new entrance music? The problem is excess to some degree. It is perfectly emblematic of the reality distortion field inside of Washington, of, of just having no sense whatsoever, one, that the rest of the country is struggling, that the government is in financially very, very bad shape, that Washington is not doing a good job, and that this goes on year after year after year. Hollywood comes to town. You have the, the collision of the bubble worlds, right? And what I think is sort of striking is th this year, uh, Kevin Spacey, um, who's the star of House of Cards, which is not a very flattering picture of Washington, and Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who is uh, the star of Veep, which is this very, very funny HBO show, uh, neither about, of, the vice uh, about the vice presidency, neither of which paint Washington in a flattering light. They both showed up to the dinner. They went to the big after party sponsored by Vanity Fair and Bloomberg, and they were both swarmed. Everyone was like, oh, we have to get our picture taken with Kevin Spacey and, and with uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who, I mean, ultimately paint a, a, a hideous portrait of how Washington works, and, and, and Washington is its most grotesque and perverse, and yet that's what we're celebrating. And, and again, it, you do sort of pinch yourself after a while and say, what are we celebrating here? Yeah, there's a sequence in Netflix's House of Cards where some of Washington's best-known journalists are playing themselves in a fantasy World. Just before we came on the air, I received an advanced copy of an article that's going to be in tomorrow's Washington Herald's front page, and it was written by Zoe Barnes. And in it, she quotes an editorial that ran in the Williams College Register when you were editor back in September 1978, which called the Israeli presence in the Gaza Strip and West Bank, quote, an illegal occupation. Quoting a source close to the president as saying that Senator Catherine Durant will likely be the new nominee for Secretary of State after Michael Curran's withdrawal. Congressman Frank Underwood says he got, quote, schooled by AFT spokesman and chief strategist Martin Spinella during a debate last night on this network. In the past 24 hours, reruns of The Gaff have played nonstop on TV news programs and the internet. Does it say something to you that prominent journalists are willing to erase the line between reality and fiction? If you look at something like House of Cards, if you look at something like the Correspondents' Dinner, where you have Hollywood and Washington merging, and you have kind of a joined mind, a joined fame machine, you realize that the lines might not be that drawn to begin with in any mind. I mean, I think one of the things, there's a scene at the end of this book in which a member of the campaign team from 2012 for President Obama said, after a while, it just seemed like everyone was thinking about who was going to play them in the next version of Game Change. This is Sarah. Which is this campaign book that, that was written by Mark Halpern and John Heilman about the 2008 campaign bestseller. And, and again, that sort of goes to the larger cinematic sense that people have of themselves here. There's a sense of preening, a sense of, who's going to play me in the movie? Um, will I get a cameo 
playing myself in the movie, as people in the Game Change movie did. That's another scene in here. And again, it's a sort of blaming, it, it's the sort of blurring of the larger class of fame, of, of really the ruling class in the public perception game, mm. that I, I think is, is as much a part of this decadence as, as really anything else. As I read this book, I felt there was, you were troubled by writing it. I mean, you're having, it's a fun book to read, as I said in the beginning, yeah. but there's something troubling you, even now, about this story. I'm more troubled now after seeing people react to it. I mean, in, in two ways. One, seeing the very legitimate and frankly very gratifying outrage that it has brought outside of town, because it gives me a level of, uh, uh, gives me a degree of faith that people can still be outraged, even when they're being amused or entertained or, or you know, being hit with, with, with nuggets or whatever it is that, that people look for. In Washington, I've been outraged again, like I've said, by the complete lack of discussion it seems to have begot. The, the complete lame pushback, the complete how dare he of this, of, of you know, sort of trying to make me an outcast that someone who has spoken out of school and someone who has tried to expose, I, I don't, actually I don't want to say I would try to expose the racket because that makes me seem more muckrakey than I probably am, but I think ultimately it, it's, um, I, I think getting out of my writer's head and getting this book out into the marketplace and seeing people experience it has helped me to see the whole of it. I was surprised when I read the book because I have followed your reporting and you were reporting good stories, anecdotal stories, and fact-driven stories, but they didn't seem to have the narrative's arc yeah. that emerges in this. Was that something you came to in the course of writing it or in the course of reporting? How did that come about? It became a moment, and it, and it did occur to me in, in being exposed to this that the political class that I'm writing about has reached some kind of critical mass in the 21st century. I, I think there's something going on in Washington that needed to be called out. But the moment I you do, talk about it. The moment I talk about it, I, again, I don't think it can be sustained, and I think it's indecent. I think it is not how Americans want their government in their capital city to be. Um, I, I think in some ways, and I always sort of cower under this, this claim when people ask me for prescriptions, but I think in some ways, I mean, I'm holding a mirror to a culture. Um, it is a culture that people only know around the edges. Um, I wanted to take it sort of full on in all its components, including the media, and, and hope to paint a picture that will stand as something that is lasting for this era. Is it conceivable to you that one, two, three, or four more people in your book might say, wait a minute, this is shameful. And, and, and they can't change it out there because we are impenetrable. So I'm going to stand up and we're going to change it from within. Look, I mean, there are a lot of good people in Washington. I mean, it sounds contradictory given a lot of what we've talked about. But, but there are people who, a lot of people who, especially when they're young or when they were young, they came from a place of decency. They came from a place of hope. Um, and that doesn't completely go away, right? So, um, look, I, I wrote a book. <clears throat> and I'm speaking as a journalist, who, that I think in probably some level was a product of disgust, my own disgust. Um, maybe even there was a level of, of unconscious desire to check myself before finding myself too deep in the club, too much a part of this world. And I mean, so look, I mean, I, I absolutely love, would love this book to be <clears throat> a source of of shame, of self-reflection, but I think I'm willing to start with discomfort. If this is a source of discomfort, I'm very happy with that too. Suppose this culture in Washington is more representative of the country today than you want to acknowledge. You know, there's a scene in David Simon's series, The Wire, where a policeman is asking one of the kids on the street, why do you go on playing this game of poker when the guy you keep inviting to the game is stealing your money? With Snap Boogie always stole the money. Why'd you let him play? God, this America, man. Because that's the American way. <laughs> what if Washington has become the Wall Street way, the Las Vegas way, the Silicon Valley way? 
it, it, it's a classic chicken egg question. What we have now in the population is a level of dissonance, right? It's a level of disgust that is, that is parallel to, um, you know, maybe some indifference, but, but that is also parallel to your own role in reelecting your congressman, your own role in watching these shouting matches on cable, your own role in perpetuating this system, in, in, being, in being transfixed by these ads. So, yes, I mean, I think that this dissonance is something that, that lives in a very, very distilled way inside our nation's capital. And I think it's acted out by these, by these real life players who are in a very writ large way experiencing both the American dream and the American nightmare. And that is something that I think makes this town, but also the nation's capital at this moment, a very, very palpable place to watch this disconnect play out. And again, it's a lot to get your head around. I, I do think it is worth a discussion, and frankly, a smarter discussion than many people in Washington are willing to have. This town is the place to begin. Uh, Mark Leibovich, thank you very much for the book, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Bill. We are so close to losing our democracy to the mercenary class, it's as if we're leaning way over the rim of the Grand Canyon and all that's needed is a swift kick in the pants. Look out below. The predators in Washington are only this far from monopoly control of our government. They've bought the political system lock, stock, and pork barrel, making change from within impossible. That's the real joke. Sometimes I long for the wit of a John Stewart or Stephen Colbert. They treat this town as burlesque and with satire and parody show it the disrespect it deserves. We laugh and punch each other on the arm and tweet that the rascals got their just dessert. But the last laugh always seems to go to the bold-faced names that populate this town. To them belong the spoils of a looted city. They get the tax breaks, the loopholes, the contracts, the payoffs. They fix the system so multimillionaire hedge fund managers and private equity tycoons pay less of a tax rate on their income than school teachers, police and firefighters, secretaries and janitors. They give subsidies to rich corporate farms and cut food stamps for working people facing hunger. They remove oversight of the Wall Street casinos, bail out the bankers who torpedo the economy, fight the modest reforms of Dodd-Frank, prolong tax havens for multinationals, and stick it to consumers while rewarding corporations. We pay. We pay at the grocery store. We pay at the gas pump. We pay the taxes they write off. Our low-wage workers pay with sweat and deprivation because this town, aloof, self-obsessed, bought off and doing very well, thank you, feels no pain. The journalists who could tell us these things rarely do, and some never. They aren't blind, simply bedazzled. Watch the evening news, any evening news, or the Sunday talk shows. Listen to the chit-chat of the early risers on morning TV, and ask yourself if you're learning anything about how this town actually works. William Grider, one of our craft's finest reporters, fierce and unbought despite a long life in Washington, once said that no one can hope to understand what is driving political behavior without asking the kind of gut-level questions politicians ask themselves in private. Who are the winners in this matter and who are the losers? Who gets the money and who has to pay? Who must be heard on this question and who can be safely ignored? Perhaps they don't ask these questions because they fear banishment from the parties and perks from the access that passes as seduction in this town. Or perhaps they don't tell us these things because they fear that if the system were exposed for what it is, outraged citizens would descend on this town and tear it apart with their bare hands.
Next week on Warriors and Company, an encore broadcast of my conversation with the remarkable John Lewis, the youngest man to speak at the March on Washington 50 years ago, and the last one still living. Where you're standing now, looking out there, that's that's all the crowd. It was good to be in the presence of Lincoln, and I feel honored to have an opportunity to come here almost 50 years later. And at our website, BillMoyers.com, visit our Money and Politics page for more in-depth coverage and analysis of how Washington's Insider Club treats government like a private ATM. That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guff charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America. Designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.